the user group meetings, the things where back in the 80s where, you know, Apple guys would all meet and share stuff, and even the theory of 2600 and what the 2600 group does, although it's gotten a little senile, it's, it's, it's turned into Dragon Con of hackers, right? That's what's happened. Is So, so there is this kind of gray area of, like, are you a furry? I don't know, like... <laughs> I, so it does change. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you never know. And the weird thing about computer forensic stuff is that some of the laws are changing everywhere, and as things happen, the community gets smaller. It's not getting bigger, it's actually getting smaller. Really? Yes, because if certain states outlaw it until you're a PI, the work that's required to become a PI ostracizes a lot of people. Because computer guys don't have a background in law enforcement. Oh. So in a lot of cases, the law enforcement guys are uh, grandfathered in right away. If they were law enforcement and they were not civilian law enforcement, then they, were, they will be grandfathered in, which is surprising. So the beat cop can become a PI and then he's legally the guy who can do forensics, not the guy who was in the office doing forensics who's a civilian, right. who is now a crime for him to actually work on his own. Seems to me in the law enforcement folks I'm, I deal with, especially up in Canada, it's like they are the digital forensics guy because they're the ones who knew how to use a computer. And it's just, they were, oh, he can kind of do that. We'll get him to do more of that. But a lot of law enforcement guys did not spend their whole life doing computers. No. Us. We oh. spent my life None as men. Probably. Most right. Of them, right. Because I would have ignored law enforcement. I wouldn't have said, I want to be a, a, a cop. Right. I want to be a computer guy. Yeah. We're the guys who know how it works. Yeah. Right? You understand what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's the downside to this, that a lot of times the law enforcement that's coming in, I'm not saying they can't learn it and they can't be trained, but they're starting 20 years after me. Yeah. And that's a difference. Yeah. I mean, I can sit here with a hex editor and crawl over it and show them how it works, but legally I would be the guy who couldn't do it. Right. Now, I solved my problem differently. In Georgia, you know, it's also you have to have a PI license to, be, to do computer forensics. Yeah. Computer forensics is a crime in Georgia, a misdemeanor, wow. but it's a crime in Georgia if you don't have a PI license. And I could not quit my job. I was already doing forensics for f six years before they made that requirement. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I bought a private investigation company that already existed. Oh. I merged it into mine, put him on the board mm -hmm. to hold the license. I was an employee but president. Mm -hmm. And so I owned the company and I paid him while I did my apprenticeship. Right. And I paid myself minimum wage for 32 hours a week. Because you have to receive a paycheck for 32 hours a week to prove. Mm. There's some people who get away without doing that, but I just paid myself minimum wage for 32 hours a week from my own company, and that's all I worked in. Mm. And so I did all the forensics work, the same stuff I was already doing, but I still had to do the PI stuff. I still had to take the class. I still have to do continuing education. I have to do the gun control stuff. I had to take the tests. Not a single item, not one of those has the word computer. Not one of those has anything. The only thing they would say is evidence, but when you're talking evidence, it's not computer evidence. It's how do you tape a scene. Physical evidence. Right. It's not how do you collect evidence. So they have no idea how that works. So ironically, here's the weirdest thing. In Georgia, if you have a PI license, you, ha you can hang your shingle out and you can do forensics. Whether you have a certificate in computer forensics or not, you need no further education. Wow, how stupid is that? Isn't that ridiculous? That is. And you think it's going that way in Ontario or Canada? I know it is. I've heard it several times. Talk to Wes. Yeah, interesting. Yep, and it's going that way in other countries. I heard Australia is going to do it as well. So, and here's my other pet peeve, a huge pet peeve I have, HTCIA. Yeah. And not that I have anything against HTCIA itself. What I have something against is their bylaw. They have a bylaw that says you cannot do defense work. Right. Right. So what they are saying, in, in flat out, straight away, because it was started by cops, yeah. and cops do not want internationally. It's an international yeah. group. They are the largest group of computer forensics people, yeah. and they say you cannot do criminal defense work, period. And if you're doing anything else that you're not really sure what a side is, you better get a request from them or they blacklist you, throw you out of the group. Wow. Right? You know what I'm talking about? For two years. Wow. So if you are... So what we're saying is everyone is guilty, and there is no reason to ever defend them because they are guilty, and therefore I have an immediate bias. Now, and I'm going to point this out, 
good or bad, for anybody who ever goes up against me, I will use it against you. I'll destroy you in court. Because that, by definition, tells everyone you are guilty and he believes you're guilty because there's no way his group can defend you and you join the group. How is that any different than joining any other group where you say, well, you know, I'm a member of a racist group, yeah. but... You know, I don't really have anything against people that are that group. Right. Like, that, how is that helpful? There's nothing against that. And so, if somebody's sitting on a stand and they're going up against me, I will use every tactic I can because HTCIA should change that by law. You cannot work as an independent. You can only work as a policeman or some law enforcement because they don't hire outside their ranks for a case that is a criminal case. So, you can't be on the prosecution unless you only work for government, military, or a corporation. That's it. The rest of them are third parties like me because we get all the defense cases because no one else will hire you. Right? That is the problem. So if you're a member of HTCIA and you go up against me in court, I will make sure that the lawyer sets up a bias and will destroy you because of that until HTCIA gets rid of that by law. So HTCIA needs to remove it. Now, I have spoke at HTCIA conferences. I have been invited. I have all the paperwork signed. I refuse to turn it in because I won't join the group if they have a bylaw for that. Now, I know people who take the cases, get the money, conflict themselves out, and keep the money because they don't want to get removed from the HTCIA group. That is worse. That is worse to take the case for a, for a defense and then keep the money and conflict yourself out because of an HTCIA bylaw to say that I can't take your case and they keep the money. That's how bad it is. Yes, that is exactly what's happening. There is one guy in Georgia who constantly do, does this. He's a member of HTCIA. He's also a private investigator. He is not supposed to take defense cases. He will take the case, take the money, and then conflict himself out and keep the money. Oh, conflict as in... Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll, he'll take the money first and then say, sorry, I can't actually do this. Yep. Right. He'll start to work on the case and then he'll say, I can't testify about this. My group and my bylaws are... Oh, so he'll do the, he might do the work, but he won't, be, he won't go to court. Well, that's when he quits. Like At that point in time, it quits. And then they have to start all over again. Oh, okay. Because you can't... That's, that's, not, that's completely worthless to defense cases sure. at all. Right. And that's a, that is a bad precedence to set as well. And this is an international group. And yeah. so this is a problem worldwide. And I've run into it when I've been in Australia or China or some of the other countries. And that is a terrible way to be. And they should change that bylaw. And I've complained about it. I've even talked all the way up the entire... When Tony Reyes was the leader of HTCI, I sat down and had a talk with him about it. They can't change it. They won't change it. And it is a terrible way to go. And it will destroy computer forensics eventually because I will set a precedence in case law. I'm getting bigger and bigger cases. I'm getting federal cases. And I'm getting multiple state cases. And I'm working in four and five other states right now. And when I run into a state that requires a PI license, I will get a waiver to work on defense cases against them. So, in other words, if you have a case that happens in another state like California and I can't normally take the case there, in order for the defense to hire me, I get them to get the prosecution to write a letter that says they will accept my testimony and no future prosecution or any additional items that they are accepting me as an expert witness in their state, even though I'm a PI in a different state and we don't have reciprocity. So I'm going to take them on. And, I'm gonna, and when I can, I'm going to take on HTCIA. So if you know anybody, you might want to tell them because it's coming. I will win sooner or later. I'll be there next week, but I don't really know anybody. I know. I know you won't get anything done in that realm. Yeah, and, and I mean, I've talked to the, to the highest people in the group, yeah, I don't and they, they are not going to make it happen. They're not going to change it. So the only way I can do it is by affecting the group. So, you know, in essence, this is probably not a lot better than Ashley Madison situation. So I don't know if you guys really understand the Ashley Madison thing. And it's not just a hacker that released this data. What happened is anybody can join anyone else to Ashley Madison with just their email address. No verification. So no verification whatsoever. There's no crossover. There's no verification. I, if I wanted to make a joke, I could take your email addresses, enter them into the system, and Ashley Madison will accept them and set up an account for you. And then you will get an email. And when you get an email and you say, I don't want to be in this group, they charged people $49 to remove them from the group. 
and they didn't actually remove them. They took your money, but they did not remove you from the database. And this is why the hackers did it. This is why whoever did it. We actually think it's an inside job. I don't know if you guys saw John McAfee's oh, really? thing yesterday. Yeah. John McAfee says it's a female who works for the company that he actually got. They gave him the material to investigate it and do. Wow. Uh, and and he says he did. And he says it is a female who works inside the company that stole the database. Really? And that published it. Um, and he has some good reasoning behind it. I don't know if he's accurate, but I didn't see everything he saw. But that was the issue, is that they charged $49 to remove you from the database. Last year, Ashley Madison made $1.7 million charging people a removal fee with no verification on the entry. So that's 34,000 people a year that were entered into a database who asked to be removed and then weren't. Wow. And they took the money. So... Apparently two people have already killed themselves yeah. because of this, and there's going to be, well, the horse lawyers all over the place are now getting a lot of calls. They also supposedly had, like, a bunch of accounts that were fake accounts posing mm -hmm. as women to make it look like there were more women on the site. Yes, exactly. right. right. Yeah, yeah they hilarious. had rooms, yeah, was it room full of people in, a uh, room full of people in Jamaica pumping out profiles? Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, they do that on Facebook, and they do that on Twitter. They do that all over the place, right? But, but anyway, those are the problems that we're faced with. Wow. But And everybody thinks, oh, well, what a shame. Ashley Madison got hacked, and then these people are killing themselves or whatever else. And maybe that is a shame, but the premise is if you're going to rip your people off, sooner or later, somebody's going to take you down. Somebody's going to get you. And, you know, that is still, as I was mentioning, it is HTCIA's problem eventually. There's a couple of these that is that kind of a problem that I deal with all the time. Um, like, since we have to have a PI license in Georgia, some people, some forensics guys don't believe you have to have a PI license because somebody wrote a blog that says you don't have to have one and that the state law doesn't affect you. But those people are appointed by the governor. So they actually have direct access to you and your business license. And so if they go up against me and they don't have a PI license, they'll never make it to court. That's the thing. These guys will get removed from a case before we ever get to court so they don't actually commit a crime because the lawyer will just back out and not keep the guy on staff, but they get the initial money and get the job and then they get removed. So these are the kind of things that are happening. So anyway, technical stuff, back to this. All right, we've mentioned this a couple of times. Um, so you have a, a new thing, a GUID partition table, and the GUID partition table allows you to have a partition bigger than two terabyte. This is a limitation, the MBR the master boot record that has been our partition structure for 30 years can only store 32 bits. And 32 bits is 4 billion. 4 billion divided by 2 at 512 byte sectors is 2 terabyte. So the GUID partition table allows you to go past 2 terabytes. But in order to use the GUID partition table, you must have a 64 bit system. So you must have at least Windows 7, 64 bit, well, Vista, right. Yep. Uh, so Windows XP 64-bit does not work. Uh, Windows 7 64-bit uh, or higher, you must have EFI. EFI is you get rid of your bias. The bias that's on your computer when you boot and you hit uh, delete and you pop into your bias and you work on it, well, that's been replaced with what's called EFI, which is Extensible Firmware uh, Interface. So you're basically replacing the bias with your firmware. Now, UEFI is where they have basically merged this in and tried to do something similar to say, we're going to use a BIOS and we're going to file. So it's a universal extensible firmware interface. So these things are required for you to use. Uh, now, here's the other problem. It's hard to go backwards. If you try to take a laptop that has EFI on it and you try to install Windows XP, well... There's some real problems trying to install that. You really have to hack it in order to make it work. So you're restricted on going backwards in a lot of things. So it's good to keep those old machines around that are running XP because you're going to need them one day. I promise. Really? Yes. I promise you're going to need it one day. Huh. The day will come that virtual machine won't work. Virtual machines don't do a lot. You can't pass a lot of data and certain things through virtual machines. So just trust me when I say those things aren't going to work. So. We're going to be switching as we go forward into GPT structures. GPT structures change. So this was our MBR, and that's where 55AA is. And then the partition structure will then fit underneath that for a few of the blocks. Now, this is to get rid of single point of failure. When a MBR goes bad, you cannot boot your system. 
But if you have GPT, it's still intact, so supposedly it's still going to boot. It makes a redundant entry for every entry in reverse at the tail of the partition or the tail of the drive. So at the tail of the drive, you're going to have all your partition entries in reverse. So they'll go backwards in reverse order. So you'll have GPT at the beginning, and then a copy of that one down here, and those are just your partition entries. So that if one fails, it can still find it and still boot. It's a good concept. Unfortunately for Windows, this is the real problem, is that the MBR still has to have 55AA in it. Nothing else has to be there but 55AA. If 55AA isn't there, Windows won't mount it. It'll see it as uninitialized, still, to this day. So you still have a single point of failure. It's a protective MBR because you're not supposed to use it on EFI or GPT systems, except that Apple changed that. Apple's the company that made that different because you couldn't boot Windows or Linux on a Mac when it was an Intel Mac back in 2006 when they first released it. So they actually changed three months after they released the first Intel Mac. Uh, hackers were already trying to make it work. So Apple finally released Boot Camp and all the other things to allow you to be able to do it. And what they do is they sync the GPT structure to the MPR. So they convert what you have here into the MBR so that the pointers will then work for your bootable boot camp. So it's booting using the MBR instead of using GPT. So there's tools like uh, Refit and things like that will actually copy those set settings into the MBR so that they will stay in sync so that you can boot your system. Everybody understand all this so far? So it's still usable and it's still needed. Um, all the numbers, those little two digit numbers that we have like 07, those things change. Those now, this is the layout for them. This is what they look like. They will look like this. <coughs> 07 is now a GUID, Globally Unique Identifier. That's what that is. Now, you will notice, like, if it's FAT32 and it's a data partition, it doesn't matter which OS it is, you'll see a repeat, because they're not supposed to repeat at all. Like Linux, if it was using FAT32, C7, there's C7. That's your basic data partition for Windows. So you might see that in multiple places if it's a FAT32 partition or something like that. That's its identifier. But every operating system slash file system will have its own unique identifier that it will be able to use on the system. And these are already done. This is all done and it's used already. But there's just not a lot of it. Okay? So just understand this is what we're looking at now. And so as we're moving forward, uh, we actually have support for this in every operating system that we have. Max pretty much won and did it first. Uh, Earlier on, it was an Intel creation for GUID partition tables, and Intel charged for the first two releases of it. So 1.0 and 1.1 were charged releases. Then they opened it up to the public, and so after that, the GUID partition information now has been usable by other people without a licensing agreement. But Microsoft didn't create it, and Microsoft has gotten a little pissed off over it several times because it's a limiting factor for some of their... Uh, operating system stuff or a problem for them because it's a lot to track in the GUID in the GUID tables this is a lot to track so one of their file systems which is not tied to size it's the only one that's not tied to size for instance how big can a FAT32 partition be what's the largest size a FAT32 partition can be no matter what it's what it's 2 terabyte, right? So 2 terabyte, 2.3 terabyte basically. So uh, it can't be larger than that because it's a 32-bit file system. It's a 32-bit FAT32, 32-bit file system. So it cannot be larger than that. Uh, FAT16, you can only do two. Uh, and, and when you're looking at file sizes and you're looking at com, you know, things that you can do, you actually have limitations. You also have a file size limitation of 4 gigs per file in FAT32 but in FAT16, it's 2 gigs per file, which is the default for why all of the FTKs and all the other stuff made image files that were 2 gigs That was or below 2 gigs. That was why they made those sizes smaller than 2 gigs so that it could be compatible across all the file systems so you could copy it. But when you get to FAT64, which is called XFAT, so this stuff is a lot to track. And, and FAT64 allows a larger partition. It's like 16 edibytes. It's really large. And your file size, you don't have a file size limitation now that's comparable to anything that we can actually imagine because it's like 
you know, I, it, I have it listed here, but it's fairly large. It's extremely large. But this content to manage this requires a processor and some activity to happen to manage your partition structures and to manage the data. And it takes size on the disk itself as you're doing this. So the thing that XFAT is being used for the most, do you guys know what XFAT, right? I'll, I'll, yeah, SD cards, right? The SD cards, it's not actually an SD card. It's an SDXC card, right? It's an SDXC card instead of an SDHC card, which we've been using up to 32 gigs. Microsoft's definition, they licensed the technology to SD uh, card association and they cannot use it past 32 gigs. So they had to come up with another file system. They already had one they invented for Windows CE, which is XFAT. So Microsoft got away kind of with murder, actually. Um, the problem is, and I'll get into this in a minute because there's more stuff with this, SDXC cards, the cameras aren't powerful enough to track the GUID partition tables. We got away SDXC cards could have partitions that are bigger than two, two terabyte if they had two terabyte cards. But because the camera can't track it, they went back to the MBR. So now they're tied back to the MBR. And the MBR, which is you know the thing they were trying to get away from, is now re-implemented back in all the cameras. So instead of using a GUID partition table so they could license it. Does this make sense to everybody? You see where I'm going? So there's a big gap. There's a, there's a, a huge gap between the MBR and it's 16 megs or whatever it is for the GUID partition table that would sit there before data starts on an SDXC card because they expect a partition table to be there. But it's not because the MBR, which then ties us to 32-bit numbers, is back tied to XFAT. It doesn't have to be that limited limitation, but it is on SDXC cards. But that's what the X stands for. And XFAT, again, is another one of those deviations of things. They use it on the Xbox. They use it on a number of other things. So that's what we're dealing with here is when we finally get to FAT64. So in a FAT file system, now here's the, th here's the bad news. FAT. When you lose FAT tables, you lost all your metadata. FAT tables keep track of your dates, your times, the file name, the structure, what directory it's in, the clusters associated with it. If you overwrote it with HFS, it would erase that content and you would lose it. And the only way that you can get data back is carving with one slight exception. You know the dot and the double dot that we have in file systems when you move up and you say CD dot dot and you go up one directory and you go to the current directory CD dot? That is stored in the file system with the clusters for the files. So as it goes through the disk, you will find the actual delimiters for dot and double dot, and then the chunk of data that's that directory structure that belongs there. Now you have fragmentation and some other problems, but fundamentally, that also is something that works. You can scan for the dot and the double dot and carve the data out from the dot to the next double dot, and that's a directory. And that's the content that belongs together in that directory structure. So you need a tool that does that because you don't want to do it manually. Right? Our studios does not do that correctly. The only one I know of, or the cheap one that I know of that does do that, some of the other tools do that. InCase does it. InCase has a script for it to search for fat directory structures and carve data out. But if you don't want to use InCase, the cheapest one that I know of is get data back for fat. It actually carves dots and double dots and recreates the directory structure from the content as it follows it. So the, once you've lost this, there's nothing else you can do, but you can carve the directory structure out. The files won't have names. They won't have dates and times. They won't have names, but they will be the data. They will be the individual items for the dates and the content that's there. Otherwise, you've lost it all. All of this stuff happens. Now, you lose the root directory no matter what. The root directory that's stored there doesn't have a dot and a double dot, so it's not, so you've lost it. It's completely gone. The only way you can get that back is to carve those files. So if you're storing data in the root directory of a FAT32 hard drive, it is not recoverable through the normal means of carving the dot and the double dot. You've got to carve the files. You've got to search for them. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, so, it does cross over on multiple mediums. I don't see a lot of fat except for thumb drives. That's really where I still see it, mostly in thumb drives. Nobody else is really using fat for very much anymore, but you may still see it from time to time. And the easiest thing I can tell you is use get data back for fat and you will be more successful than most other tools. 
Um, and then I did list all the clusters and all the other stuff. The other thing important to note on fat is that there, there is, you're missing one of the pieces of content. You're missing access time. There is no time because it took time to update it. They had to drop it out and there's no space for it. They're missing space. Let me show you what I mean. This is the layout of, remember we had 8.3 characters? That's all we had, DOS 8.3. There was no long file names. This, that's here. This part right here, the two bottom records here, this is what it looks like on the hard drive in hex. In hex, you would see this content, the quick brown box. Now, the tilde means we got to Windows 95 because Windows 95 renames anything with redundancy and puts a number. So anything that has a long file name or would have a long file name has a number. So here's the thing. Going across here, this is what the storage was when it was 8.3 characters. There is a flag called 20. And 20 is I have a short file name. This is my file. Okay? And then following that, you see we have enough space to create time, create date, last access date. There wasn't enough data, enough space to store time. And the time would get updated across all the records if you went into a directory and you touched it. So it took a lot of work for the system to do that. Then you actually see modified time, date, cluster, and size. So this content that's stored here, so there wasn't enough space to put some things. And they also know what's the record that's next after this one. If you were doing 8.3 characters, there would be another one of these right below it. And the software expects there to be another one right below it. Does that make sense? So in order to process this, they did it in reverse. So the long file names are stored with the same size record they hacked the system basically when they wanted to put long file names in and they restored them in reverse. You see them? So the quick brown fox belongs here. Now here's something your software does for you today that did not happen. Anybody use Norton undelete back in the day? You guys remember Norton? When you undeleted a file, because it's one of the first tools that did that, what happened to the first character? Chambers. It was gone, right? It was gone and it would say, what would you like to name this character? And you could either, a lot of people just held down T or held down a character and then they went back and looked at the file and renamed it. But initially, you lose your first character. And that's because when you erase this file, it would put 5E right here in this first block. And that's the signature that says I am deleted, right? There was no long file name. So there was no place to get that character from. So when it overwrote it, it didn't know what it was. There was no way for it to figure it out. It was gone. So when you undeleted something, all it did was look through the file system for 5E and then said, okay, fine, here's a file. What do you want? And then it reassembled it from these clusters and brought it back to life. Okay? Long file names, so what they did was they made sequence of numbers. See that number right there? Now the sequence numbers count up in reverse. So it's 01, 02, 03, 04. However long your file name is, up to 256 characters, you would actually be able to store that all the way up. The signature for the last one is a function called exclusive or. Exclusive or is a mathematical equation and it's exclusive or with the sequence number. So you see where it says 42? So you look for the last one to be excluded, exclusive or with it in reverse. So. You have the quick brown fox, and so it uses up all the space it can except for wherever they need to write something so they can double check it. So you can see each one, and it just splits up the characters depending on things they needed to keep for its position. This one, OF, means long file name. That's what that means. OF is long file name, 20 is short file name. Okay? Your system can actually still choose to, just, to have short file names or long file names. You can actually turn them on and turn them off. But your letters are all stored in the other positions, which would have been time, date, and all the other content. So it's still using this record for the time and the date, and it's still using this content now for all the storage of all the characters. So this is a flag, and that is a flag. So as you go backwards, the quick brown fox right here, then it would say, I'm on record 01. Is this exclusive order with 40? No. Then I'm going to read one more. So then you go up to the next one. And then this is the continuation of the characters, again, until you actually get to the end of the file, okay? Everybody understand? The, it'll check the last record to say, am I exclusive or with 40 before you delete it. So if you delete a file in FAT32, this is what it looks like. This is the real file. 
This is the content. You can actually see here. Here's the short file name. All of this content right here is in hex. So this content, not that E5 does not mean it's deleted. That E5 is part of the date and time signature. It's part of the creation date. Okay, you ready? Creation date. So this is the short file name. So this is the shortest file name with the extension and then dates and times. So then you go up and you go up the pair. So the pair is here. So the first part is the sequence number. This is the real beginning of the long file name. Your software automatically will convert this character from here and replace it during a data recovery now. That's why it does not ask you to enter in the first character anymore. If you look at the next screen here, the next screen is it is erased. So here is, here is it deleted. So S is deleted because E5 is the flag that got written there. Understand? So E5 overwrote the S. They do not know what it is. The only way you can calculate what it is is from the record above and that S right there is pulled from here and when it's written, it's actually reading this and doing it automatically for you. Everybody understand? So, so this right here, if you're going backwards, if you look, so this would have been a sequence number. So these would be sequence numbers that would be going backwards. So if you want to see long file names, here's where it goes. So here's your first part of the long file name, sequence number one. Is that going to be the last one? No. So... So that's super, super, super. So you go up again. Sequence number two. And then you'll read super, super, super. Is that the last record? Go up again. O3. Super, super, super long, long, long. Is that the last record? Yes. No. Well, it's the next 40, 44. So this is the next long. So this one right here, as you're reading across on 44, then this becomes the rest of the record. So... 44 is exclusive ORD with 4, that's the last sequence number, and the one above it now is another file that was deleted, copyright.txt. So this is the last one in the sequence number. So that's how you reassemble your long file names. Now you're going to see this a lot actually, not just in long file names, but in fix-up bytes in MFTs. MFTs have fix-up bytes and it does a similar thing. But Here's the thing, see this right here, if you want to know right away whether or not files are deleted and whether or not they're deleted by Windows or Linux, okay? If you take a FAT32 drive and you plug it into Linux, there's always that guy who thinks he's smarter than you and he's going to delete a file in Linux because he doesn't think it's going to leave a trace behind. So Linux does not use the same code to run and deal with FAT32 drives that Microsoft did because they were afraid they'd be sued and that it would be removed from their code. So what they did instead was, instead of writing E5 here, what they decided to do was get rid of the flags for the file names. If you get rid of the flags, apparently Microsoft and other tools cannot see the file name, even if that's not E5. So they don't change this one to E5 when it's deleted. They change this one to E5. So in this particular instance, this one was deleted on a Windows system. So on Windows, you can see E5, 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 E5. If that was still intact, then come over here and look here. 20, OF, 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 OF. Those would have E5 over those labels if you deleted it in Linux. Now, verify, practice but verify. But I'm going to tell you, in, in the situations I've been in, I've been able to tell somebody used Linux in order to delete the file. Name, delete the file and that did not have E5 in it. And that meant some data recovery software would not work correctly. The data recovery software expects it to be E5 there, not E5 there. Understand what I mean? So these are things that sometimes you have to look at with a hex editor in order to accomplish it. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so when you run into a situation, you know, a situation like that, and you understand that, uh, you know, maybe some of the... Uh, software that you have might not be able to understand it. Yep. And you don't have a choice of another, you know, so how do you walk around that you are in the middle of nowhere, you know? Well, the answer is you have to get smart and work harder. That's the answer. 
And so I verify, like, I don't accept that Celebrite's answer is what Celebrite's answer is. I go and look at the database myself. If it's an important piece. If it's not an important piece, then I may not do that. But if I'm doing, if I'm doing, uh, let's say I'm doing a child porn case, and I'm using a tool that goes and does a data recovery, and there's a chance this guy might have used Linux to do some things, I'm also going to go and look at the hard drive in hex with an editor and review this. This is the thing that makes me different than what the police are doing or somebody else is doing. I may find things that they didn't find. These files might not be recoverable. Now they're probably carving, so they're probably also getting the files other ways. So it depends on how you're looking at this, but you may have to examine this and figure this out. That's the, where the controversy comes in when you say, I know something you don't know. Well, that's how you know it. You don't just trust your tool and say, oh, my tool was a happy tool. Those programmers just know enough to get the job done, but they don't know what's unexpected. They don't know what happens when it's broken. And so you'll be in a situation where you'll run your tool and you'll get an unexpected result. And in this case, for instance, you may get, you may get, um, you may actually have a data recovery program that actually either crashes or reads the data but also misses the first character or doesn't recover files but you know you have a number of records. You can look at your records and you can say, I have 65 records. Why don't I have 65 files? You can start trying to determine those things. And I don't have an easy answer for you that says, oh, every time do this. Um, I say anytime that something's important and somebody says this database is used as evidence, then I start figuring out what that database says in it. I don't just accept what the tool parsed out. Does that make sense to anybody? If that's what is evidence or if that's what's happening. Or in the case of data recovery, a client says, you know, there used to be a directory structure that had my vacation pictures in it. So I can't find them. Well, I might have to look in hex. I might have to go and do it manually. And I'm going to show you how we can do some of that stuff now. Uh, I need to tell you a couple things about NTFS before we do it. But the majority of the stuff that you can do inside of, of a DOS, like, because here's the other thing. Your drive was overwritten by HFS. I'm going to open it up in hex, and you can do a simple thing. You can search in segments for certain pieces of information. So you can search for a pattern of OF and 20. You can search for the pattern and find it and then see the names. And then, you know, this part right here, these are the parts that tell you where the clusters are. You can convert those. So if we go back and you look, there's your first cluster and there's the file size. So you can go back and find where the first cluster is by converting it. It's eight sectors at a time, right? So depending on what you know about it, you can say, oh, well, and it doesn't have to be eight sectors. In this case, it's fat. So it depends on which one you have and where your clusters are. So you have to start looking at this stuff if you're going to do it manually. This is what's the difference between being automatic and just using a piece of software. I may have to convert from one to the other. And that's where it starts getting nasty. But you can search for this stuff. And my whole point is, if you've never looked at hex, at least this has some meaning to you. Like if you can, you start with something, instead of looking at stuff you don't understand at all, start with something that's documented that you do understand, look at it and get used to looking at it and decoding it, and then switch to the thing that you need to work on. And it'll start to slowly make sense to you as you're looking for patterns and you're looking for segments and you're looking for 32-bit numbers and you're looking for things that you need to convert. So... What we just described is actually his life, right? That's what you do all day long, right? So Ben, ben has the fun job of doing this all day long, right? Okay. Yeah, it is fun when you win, right? It's not always fun until you win. But, but anyway, so that's kind of the direction we're going. There's the entire spec for uh, FAT32. FAT64 was designed around Windows CE. It is, uh, we've already just talked about it like six or seven times. It is supported in our studios. There's a number of other tools. Your worst problem with FAT64 is this. People have been writing drivers and tools for FAT32 for a long time. And since FAT64 is the replacement for FAT32, in devices higher than 32 gigs, the programmers are awful. The programmers who were working with that previous spec wrote it 15 years ago. They didn't need to mess with it again. So they, they're gone. So people who are writing stuff for FAT64, it is way more complicated. And they're messing it up all the time. You'll actually see on a lot of websites, um, camera manufacturers telling you, do not 
delete files from your camera if you are using XFAT. There actually is a statement from many camera manufacturers on their sites that will say your card will get corrupted. Mm -hmm. And it's because they don't know how to manage it and it requires, it was so robust and there's so many things in FAT64. I mean, it stores UTC time, local time, it stores GPS coordinates. It stores a lot of content inside of the FAT64 file system and it doesn't know how to manage them and cameras are pretty dumb devices. So, uh, so things will get messed up. The, here's the other thing is Microsoft, when they made FAT64, they got a lot of vendors to agree you need FAT64 or you can't support SDXC. The SDXC cards that you have to use uh, for cameras and for other content are not supported above 32 gigs. So if you want a new laptop and you want a Mac and you want to plug in a 64 gig memory stick, it's got to be an SDXC card to make that happen. Okay? So it's got to be on XFAT. You can maybe reformat it, but when you buy an SDXC card, it's formatted XFAT. And those people who agreed paid $300,000 to Microsoft. There's a licensing agreement and there's over 1,100 vendors that paid Microsoft $300,000 for the right to use that. And the one thing that they did was try to eliminate Linux. They don't like Linux being able to use XFAT at all. So in order to get Linux to be able to see XFAT, um, Tuxera, you guys know who Tuxera is? They made a 3G driver for NTFS. They licensed it from Microsoft because the patent laws are so stringent, they can't duplicate it or duplicate the content because it is there's too much for it to do to say, oh, we're not using your stuff, we're not using your patent, we're not using your content. So Linux technically has to pay for it. Now where this hurts Linux is you can't release a distribution with code that you have paid for. It must be free. You must release it for free. And because of patents, they can't release it. So the only way they can get XFAT into Linux is to do it as embedded devices. <clears throat> so like Samsung can pay for it and then put it in their device as an additional item, but they cannot do it as part of what the core that they have to release is because they have to release the code if it's a, if it's a, um, a Linux-based device. There, there's a whole argument going on here. There is a driver, but it's not made in this country, and the guy says, screw Microsoft, I don't care what they say. Right? That's, what, that's what's happened, basically. Right? Everybody okay with this concept so far? Now, um, you will run into XFAT. You're going to start running into it in other places. It's still not really widely used, but Microsoft and Apple have an agreement. A lot of people don't know how in bed they are with each other. They are extremely in bed with each other, and they have, for instance, did you, you know Apple no longer makes a server, right? Because their agreement with Microsoft is we won't duplicate services. You guys are in the corporate arena. You already make a server, so we cannot duplicate what you are doing in our agreement, so therefore we will kill our server. And Microsoft did the opposite with the phone. And basically that's why the Windows phone looks so much different and that's why their interface looks different is they can't, re they can't repeat what Apple's doing. They have an agreement. And so um, the front end of Apple's servers is Solaris. Isn't that hilarious? The front end of Apple servers are, are Solaris. The back end is basically a modified version of Exchange Server with ActiveSync running on it. That's why it works so well on your phone when you run ActiveSync. ActiveSync is a service even though Apple owns you know, the iCloud service and they own uh, that's why it works so well with Exchange Servers. It's the same service. Microsoft licensed ActiveSync to them to, and the server and that's their back end. Uh, I understand SharePortal is also involved too. That SharePortal from Microsoft services is part of the document services that they're using on the end for their shared iWork stuff. So Apple's changing it so it makes it invisible in many ways, but fundamentally that's what's happening. They're in bed with each other. Apple added XFAT in 2010 to their, to their OS. So since 2010, XFAT is now natively supported and formats drives in XFAT. Microsoft's OS, if you were on Windows, what's the largest you can format FAT32? If you're on Windows, 32 gigs. That's the largest on Windows you can format since Windows 2000. Windows 2000 put the limitation in place 
And what did we not have in 2000 when they limited it that we have today? Thumb drives. We did not have thumb drives that were larger than 32 gigs. They didn't, we didn't even have thumb drives. <laughs> we didn't even have thumb drives in 2000. So uh, now we format our thumb drives FAT32 for compatibility, but it's a pretty shitty file system. We should not be using it. It gets corrupt very quickly, and there's some other things that can happen. But that's why we format them as, a 30, as FAT32. You can't format it natively inside of Windows. It comes pre-formatted, so people don't erase them and reformat them. There's a utility you have to download in order to actually format them, FAT32, if they're over 32 gigs. Otherwise, they will format as XFAT. You can format FAT32 in Mac OS up to 2 terabyte. You can format FAT32 in a Linux system up to 2 terabyte. You just can't do it in the native system, Windows. Mm -hmm. Windows restricts it on purpose because they say the cluster size is inefficient. They wanted you to use NTFS. NTFS will kill a thumb drive. You guys realize that, right? The right segments and the things that it does on a thumb drive will mess up a thumb drive. So that's why that doesn't work. So it slowly becomes a huge problem. So let's talk about NTFS and we're going to do some labs before you all fall asleep. First thing is four important records. Those are the most four important records. The NTFS boot sector, the master file table. What page are we on? What is that? 55. So, NTFS boot sector, master file table. That's a pointer to where the MFT entries begin. Then you have to parse out the data and the sizes. You have your file system data and your master file table copy. Now, this is, a, this is something that people think happens, that it's a complete duplicate of your master file table. It is not. It absolutely is not. It is a pointer and it has these same four records. And it is in the middle of the partition structure. So you format a drive, you make a partition. When you do, it creates the MFT uh, table and the pointers, and it's called NTFS. So it's NTFS is the file system that you're actually making. MFT is what's there. These are four records. They are duplicated. You go to the end of the partition, divide by two minus one. That way you get rid of zero and you put down a new partition structure or you write these four records there. That way if it dies, something fails, it can go to the center of the disk find the record and then come back and say, okay, here's where the pointers were. It's to remove single sector failure. Okay? That's what it's for. But it is not a duplicate of your master file table. There is no duplicate master file table. In Mac OS, HFS, catalog, there is no duplicate of the catalog. There is only one copy. There's no redundancy at all. MFT, there's no redundancy in Windows for the master file table. Linux is the only one that has redundancy. So on, on the GUID, they have a duplicate, right? The GUID partition table. Yeah. The partition table does. Okay. So that's the structure for the partition that tells the drive where to go. But that is not the operating system. You can have... I mean, when you can have a GUID partition table that points to HFS, and then you can still have a catalog for HFS, but it's the only one that's going to exist. So the partition table is separate from the format and the file system. So this is a file system thing, not a partition table thing. Okay? All right, so these are those records. Uh, <clears throat> then you're actually looking at this point for the string and the versions that identify where you are on the drive for your partition structure. So NTFS will actually have a string that will then start and tell you, I am NTFS. You can search for this, and that's actually what the tools, when you say, I would like to find out if I have a partition that is lost, that's actually the kind of content it's looking for. So in hex, it's actually looking for this string of content, and then there's a version number that's in here. So it's looking for this string in order to say, oh yes, I have an NTFS partition, here it is. Or an HFS partition, which has a JFS plus... There's, a, there's actually a marker there. I'll show it to you. Uh, but there's actually a lot of stuff there. Inside of NTFS, these are the records. There's a, so these, there's 16 total records. These 12 are reserved. So going backwards, you have these records. Now, each one of these is really a mini little database, but it's just raw space on the disk. So let me describe how this works. $MFT is the most important record. $MFT is a collection 
of every file and directory structure two sectors at a time. It's the collection. You can see it as a file when your system's running because it's $MFT. That is the first record. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You've seen it a lot, it's data, but they stand alone. Those records all stand alone, but only the operating system collects them together and then presents them as $MFT. So we'll see those when we're doing a recovery. The mirror is only 4K. It is not a copy of the MFT. Do not misunderstand that because you don't need this pretty BS. It's not going to help you. Okay? The next one is log file. These are for transactions to be backed out. There's some logging when your transactions are backed out that it logs and then adds to a table. And that's under quota and under some other items. There's a whole bunch of items that are added there. We do not need that for recovery. We do not need the MFT re mirror for recovery almost ever. We do need dollar MFT. That's the most important one. Volume. Dollar volume has the name of the volume and it also has a serial number that's done at format at the time it's formatted. But it contains one other thing that no one else ever knew until about a year or two ago. And that's the dirty flag. You guys know what a dirty bit is? You ever heard of a dirty bit? You know when your system crashes and then it reboots and then it says, do you want to scan this hard drive and clean up all these records? That's where it's stored. So in this record, what happens is when your system boots, it sets the flag. If you shut it down appropriately, it turns the flag back. So if it crashes, the flag is still set. So all it does is change a bit and says, oh, it was running. And if the system reboots, then it says, oh, it was running. And then does scan disk and eats your files. The reason it eats your files does three stages for verification. <clears throat> One of the stages is a comparison for any files that were being written that did not get complete during the crash. So if you're writing a file and it did not complete, it will then eat it. Because it considers it an invalid transaction, it was not complete. You know what, uh, you've heard journaling, right? Journaling and transaction are the same thing. It's a Microsoft name for journaling. So journaling, which previously existed in a Unix environment for 100 years, Microsoft decided just not to use. I was exaggerating, since 1970. Uh, <coughs> Microsoft decided to call it transaction-oriented, but it's the same thing. If an entry does not finish, it will back it out. And I will show you what that flag does when it's actually running. That's what causes scan disk to kick off. Now, on Windows 8 and later, it runs automatically live. Okay? Windows 7 and later, Windows 8 and later, Windows 7, I think. Windows 7 and later, it does automatically. It will erase your files if a transaction is not finished, even if the system still runs and it doesn't crash. So that's when you say, do a check disk when I reboot, that's the flag it sets. <clears throat> you don't need it to recover anything. But it is there and sometimes cool to look at. Uh, you don't need... You don't need the attributes specifically from this set, from this location. You don't need the root folder. You do need the bitmap. What does a bitmap do? We copied the bitmap in the deep spar. We copied it in the Atola. The deep so when you are looking at the bitmap, the bitmap just has a flag that says I am in use or I am not in use. So all the sectors that are in the partition are mapped and it says these are used, these are not. So when the operating system says, hey, I need to write a file, the file system goes, hey, guess what? I got some free space over here. That free space may have had files in it before. That's how, what we're recovering. That's our recoveries. But if it's going to write over it, that's where it gets its flag that says I'm going to get access to that space. Boot, we do not need at all. And all of our data recovery software uses the bitmap, by the way, so that we can actually see allocated and unallocated. If we have, if we have allocated, then those files should, end, they should be in the MFT entry. If they are unallocated, then they are, the only way you can get them back is what? If they are not in the bitmap, then they're not in the MFT. How can you get them back? Carve. That's it. Carve. Security descriptor file. You know that security that we talked about this morning? That's the file. This is the file that says, hey, Bob cannot touch Susie's stuff. Bob belongs to a domain. And that is a combination of what's called the RID and the SID numbers. And those two are combined. And when that number matches a domain's entry, it allows you to have access to it. When it doesn't, it falls out of the domain, 
then physically you have no access to it. And that's what happened this morning that we were talking about our studios doing it remotely. Did you do it already? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's right. Exactly. Ten minutes. I don't understand. It's like actually in Belgium, so they're ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. Ahead of us by a day. So Belgium, six hours. Yeah, you had time. It was still good. It was only six o'clock there. <laughs> it was at lunch. Um, seven. It was seven o'clock, right? Because <clears throat> right now it's nine. Right? It depends on... Hey, Siri. No. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, hey, Alexa, Amazon, tell me what time it is in Belgium. But we don't have that here. Uh, I'm going to start carrying one with me. It's like commercial last night, though. I kind of know what it is. I yeah, I did too. Yeah. It is awesome. Yeah. Like, awesome. I'll be walking around the house and I'll be going, I'm going to go to uh, Australia in December. What's the temperature? Hey, Alexa, what's, what's the temperature in Australia in December? And she'll tell average temperature is... 14 degrees Celsius. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, so security descriptor file. We don't need this and none of our tools mount it. And here's the amazing thing. Windows is the only operating system that actually will mount and look at its own security descriptors. If I take a hard drive from Windows and I plug it into a Mac, I have access to all of the stuff. You can just tell them. You just, well, that's what you tell them. Yeah. You, you could see, instead of doing our studio recovery and getting paid for it, you could just say, why don't you just plug it in the Mac? Yeah. And yeah. there you go. Sure. Right? You'll see all your files. There they are. That's it. That's all they got to do. And they will have access to it, but you should get paid instead. Yeah. Right? Yep. No, I've done that before right. because I've had people who, like, you know, had a drive from an older system that died or whatever and then right. tried to move files. Yep. Like, yeah, don't think so. Right. But on the Mac, it's like, Right. And same thing in um, Linux. You know, if you plug that yeah. same drive into Linux, no security descriptors are mounted at all. But there's other ways we can do it. We don't need to do it. We can do it free or we can do it expensive. Uh, and then we, the other tables we don't need for extended stuff or anything like this. None of this is going to be for data recovery purposes unless there's something lost that we're actually going to have to parse. So we don't need any of these tables. We only actually need one table to do a recovery. That one. That's the only one we need. So that's the only thing we care about. And I can do a recovery without the table. It's only two sectors per a file. So even if it's damaged and the MFT is damaged, it's not like the catalog on a Mac where you lose everything afterwards. There are two sectors at a time. I can do every file individually or every item individually. I will show you exactly what it looks like. So, so this is where the transactions drop off. Here's your security problem we just described. So I'm doing a recovery. I take a drive that was in somebody else's domain. I plug it into Windows. Explorer will not give me access to it because through the APIs. So you can see here, here's my RAID. The drive is actually labeled C, but it's my F drive because I plugged it into my system. And on that drive, there's a guy named Stow Cowboy. Snow Cowboy's files are his private file. Because you can also do the exact same thing by setting the button that says set my files to private. It's the same thing as the domain, but it's a private ID. You don't have to combine it with the RID and the SID. But it's the same thing. So here's the, here's the question I have for you. <clears throat> so let's say Snow Cowboy's files are protected. And so if I go and I click